Hi, I'm Tim and thank you for joining this Tech Tips Live event from Parents Own. If this is your first Parents Own event, we're an organisation devoted to improving outcomes for children, especially in the ever-changing online world. This session is all about gaming, which is of course a huge topic. Today though, we'll be focusing on how money is made within online games and how children are encouraged to spend, trade and in some cases gamble. We'll highlight the risks and the things you, as a parent, need to consider. This session is interactive, so please say hi or pop any comments and questions you have into the chat. And keep a lookout for helpful links and resources which we'll be sharing throughout. This session should last about 15 minutes, but we know you're busy, so if you have to head off or make a start on dinner, sort out school uniforms or help with homework, you can re-watch the session on this same link. And please note, we cannot help with individual concerns during this session, but we are here to help. So if there's something related to today's themes that you need personal support with, you can get in touch with ParentZone using the email address in the chat. So that's the housekeeping done. Let's get on with today's session. You may be a big gamer or an occasional gamer on your phone or just not get it at all. But for many children, gaming is a huge part of their lives. Before we properly get going, it's good to remind ourselves, gamers and non-gamers alike, of how the industry has evolved with a very quick history lesson. Back in the 1970s and 80s, gaming was largely restricted to arcades, and games like Pac-Man made the industry worth over one billion even back then. Through the 1990s, home and mobile consoles became more advanced, with the likes of Nintendo Game Boy and Sega Mega Drive, and the launch of the Xbox and PlayStation. By the noughties, sixth-generation consoles like the Xbox One and PlayStation 2 introduced online connected play as a central feature. Meanwhile, the mobile gaming industry grew as smartphones became everyday items. By 2018, these mobile games, led by enormously popular titles like Candy Crush, were worth over £50 billion annually and formed over half of the global games market. Now, in 2023, the gaming industry is worth 300 billion. These figures can be a little eye-watering, but they illustrate just how much money there is to be made through gaming. A decade ago, a parent talk like this may have centred on the issues like video game violence. Today, one of the key concerns is how children are financially exploited during gaming. And here's a really important point. At Parents Own, we consider gaming a really positive thing for children. Current research actually tells us that gaming can improve a wide range of skills and abilities. Educational, promoting cognitive problem-solving skills and emotional intelligence. Pro-social, helping us to work, communicating with others, and perhaps most importantly, fun. Improving moods and relieving stress. And, given how rich and diverse gaming titles are these days, gaming shouldn't be seen as inferior to offline activities in any way. As you may have spotted with your child, the entertainment value and immersive nature of games can also make it difficult for children to stop playing. They're designed in such a way to keep users having fun and coming back for more. And this isn't the only thing that some games are designed to do. Many are made in such a way that users are able to spend money in game, but are also pressured into making these very purchases. When games are designed to allow users to spend, we describe them as being monetized. And when game design starts to pressure players, it's often through dark nudge techniques. But more on these two terms shortly. Earlier in our brief history lesson, we saw how huge the gaming industry is. And it's one that keeps growing, thanks in part to those changes in how games are designed, accessed and played. The massively popular online game Fortnite, for example, has over 80 million monthly users and annual revenues of billions of pounds. Fortnite and Roblox are so popular that big-name brands and companies like Marvel, Adidas and Star Wars are keen to collaborate in-game. And games don't have to be as large as Roblox or Fortnite, or even remotely mainstream, for them to be monetized and profitable. In fact, there are estimated to be at least seven games for mobile that make more than £70 million monthly, largely thanks to in-game purchases. Now, we live in a commercial world, and much of the time, this isn't a bad thing. After all, very little comes for free, and we're happy to spend money time and time again on brands or activities we enjoy. But we might think a little bit differently about the profits of gaming companies if their methods are manipulative, especially when it comes to children. 
Naturally, one way to increase profits is to make it easier for people to repeatedly spend money on your products which they like. And this is what we mean when we talk about monetization. It involves changes to the features of the games themselves, which then allow users to keep making purchases. Monetized parts of the games can be additional content or levels, special items which give you an advantage, or simply customizations for characters or weapons, sometimes known as skins. Increasingly, we see a business model where companies are happy to release games for free, much like Roblox, if they expect to make a profit a bit further down the line via in-game purchases, something which would have been basically unheard of 20 years ago. Now, let's have a bit more of a look at in-game purchases and some of the tactics companies are using to get us spending. Initially, in-game purchases might seem fairly inexpensive, at least compared to the cost of buying the latest copy of an Xbox game for £60 to £80. Pounds. This is why we call them microtransactions. These microtransactions can, however, really start to add up, as whereas before you'd be expected to shell out a one-time fee, now you can essentially spend as much as you like unlocking content or customising characters. And one of the challenges of keeping track of spending in-game is that many use virtual currencies like Fortnite's V-Bucks or Robux in Roblox. Children and young people, especially those developing numeracy skills, can struggle to understand the exchange rate between these virtual currencies and their offline, real-world counterparts like pounds or dollars. One sort of microtransaction is called a loot box. If you're not familiar, these are things which are bought in-game and which contain random prizes, a bit like treasure chests which the player cannot see into. These prizes might be items which offer an advantage to a player, like a unique weapon or character, or they can be purely cosmetic, like an emote or skin. Some of these prizes can be really rare and therefore very desirable in the eyes of players, but the chances of getting the rarer sorts of items are naturally lower, and because players usually can't see what the prize is when buying a loot box, they can be disappointed to find an item they already own, and be incentivized to keep buying in order to get the thing they're after. Experts suggest that although loot boxes might appear to be relatively harmless, especially if we focus on their individually small price tags, they can actually place a great deal of pressure on children to spend money, and in some cases promote gambling-like behaviours. More on this shortly. As mentioned already, game companies use specific types of game design and advertisement as a tactic to get users spending money in higher amounts and more frequently. These are often labelled dark nudge techniques, Nudge, because users are nudged towards doing something they might not have otherwise done, and dark because the behaviours that come about can be damaging to the individual, or not in their best interests. Examples of these include pop-ups. These are advertisements which quite literally pop up on the user's screen. They're really common on loads of websites and apps. Within games, these advertisements might be smaller and sit on the side of the screen, or they might take up the screen entirely and disrupt play. Some games have pop-ups which occur very frequently, multiple times in one session, for instance, and can be difficult or confusing to get rid of, which sometimes mean people simply purchase out of frustration. Time-limited offers. These sorts of advertisements are designed to instill a sense of urgency into the user by offering them supposedly good deals. The actual offering might be additional content, some skins and customization, or even a bundle deal on more loot boxes. These advertisements can occur really frequently and often emphasise the fact that they are only available for a limited amount of time, occasionally being accompanied by a countdown timer. This can all add to the pressure users face and their willingness to purchase. Maybe most worrying is the link between games and gambling, which I mentioned earlier. Although experts are reluctant to say that things like loot boxes can cause addiction, there's a lot of agreement that these features of games are a lot like gambling. Imagine popping a small amount of money into a slot machine in the hopes of winning a bigger, unknown prize. It's really not that different. And, like gambling, people feel a massive buzz when they win a great prize, and they might equally feel the need to continue spending money if they've already invested some and haven't got the rewards they'd like. Despite this practically being a lottery, loot boxes aren't classified as gambling within the UK. However, this is a change we at Parents Own believe needs to take place. Now, of course, things like loot boxes aren't needed to take part in and enjoy the game that they're present in. But the constantly looming chances of a big reward can be massively tempting for children. 
Some of Parent Zone's past research into the impact of video game monetization found that 49% of children think that video games are only fun when you spend money. And it's clear from stats like this that these tactics work for the games companies and games, but not for the children using them. Children might feel left out if they're unable to access content and levels that their friends are chatting about at school. They might be distressed that the last five loot boxes that they bought haven't contained anything new. Or even angry that they constantly see players with the latest weapons or characters that they don't own yet. And when children repeatedly feel like this thanks to the way a game is designed, as well as being pressured or to some extent forced to spend money, it's clear that there is harm taking place. The figures we've seen today can be eye-opening, there's no doubt about that. And it's also a bit upsetting to think that the things children love and use for entertainment can at times just view them as a customer and a way to generate profit, even if it means causing harm. But remember that not all games are monetized, and even if a title does feature monetized elements, this can come in varying degrees of severity. It doesn't necessarily mean that the games will heavily rely on dark nudge techniques, if at all. Keep all the positives of gaming, all the socialising, learning, problem solving and fun in mind. Monetization doesn't signal the end of gaming or of enjoyment. It's just something for both parents and children to navigate together. Next, we'll look at some of the extra things to consider when wanting to minimise risks and just what navigating monetization might look like in practice. Now, nobody's saying you've got to spend hours at weekends perfecting your Fortnite skills or Minecraft building, but the best way to feel confident around the games your child uses and to see how it affects them is to familiarise yourself with these titles by getting involved yourself. Spend a bit of time working out whether there are paywalls which restrict gameplay or content which is exclusive to those who pay for it. If your child is frequently showing great levels of distress at these limits to the game, then this might not be an ideal title for them at this stage. And if in your experience of a game you yourself encounter tons of pop-up advertisements or limited time offers, you might better appreciate why your child has been getting upset and asking you for money recently. Alternatively, if a game is monetized but doesn't appear to be toxic or manipulative and your child does want to spend money in the title, then you might agree a small fixed amount which they can spend per month rather than all of the birthday money in one go. And not every instance of monetization is going to be really problematic and your experience combined with parental intuition will help determine the more worrying kinds of games. Having a discussion with your child about some of these issues can be a great way of steering them away from harms and risky behaviour when they're young, and an equally great way of getting them to think a bit more critically when they're older. It's also a perfect opportunity to get their perspective on things, and to let them know that they can come to you if they're worried about anything. Depending on their age, it might be worth discussing why games encourage you to spend, and how they do it, especially when the games are free to begin with. You don't need to be an expert on dark nudge techniques to remind your child that companies are there to make a profit. And although conversations about, say, the value of money might seem a bit old fashioned, they're actually more important than ever. This is especially true in cases where children might struggle to grasp the proper value of virtual currencies, or how plenty of microtransactions can stack up. One very practical tip is not to save any of your card details onto devices which your children use. Hopefully, by taking the time to explain some of these points, you'll be able to minimise any upsets. As I suggested just now, after evaluating a certain game and its impact on your child, you might feel comfortable with them occasionally spending small amounts of money on it. Provided you're comfortable with a specific title, and you're satisfied that your child has taken on board the things you've discussed, then allowing them to make small purchases, especially with their own pocket money, can be a positive thing. Done correctly, a little bit of financial independence is a really good way of giving your child a sense of responsibility and one route to helping them appreciate the value and cost of things in an increasingly commercialised world. Thank you to everyone who found the time to join today. This video will be ready to watch back so you can share with anyone you think might find it useful or watch back yourself to check anything you weren't sure of or might have missed. You can also view the Parents' Own Library, where, as mentioned, we have tons of guides to games, platforms, setting up tech and streaming, as well as information and advice on digital issues that affect families. We'll link these in the chat now. Thanks once again from me, Tim, and the rest of us at Parents' Own, 
and enjoy the rest of your evening.